Okay, welcome everybody to uh, the uh, Nokia Distinguished Lecture Series on Cyber-Physical Systems, which is organized by Citrus, the Center for Information Technology and Research in the Interest of Society, and CCIT, the California Center for Innovative Transportation. My name is Alex Bain. I'm an assistant professor in systems engineering over in the CE department. Um, this lecture series is organized at Citrus by the Intelligent Infrastructure Cluster, and for those of you who are watching us online uh, from uh, Santa Cruz, uh, Merced, um, or Davis, you can IM us uh, our questions, and they will be read to the speaker at the end of the seminar. Um, the Nokia Distinguished Lecture series on cyber-physical systems um, was funded by Nokia, and I think the, one of the goals of the, of the series uh, was to assemble a set of speakers uh, that work on problems which ally physical processes at the same time as computational processes. And I think we have had a wonderful set of, uh, of speakers which have spanned all uh, the spectrum of engineering from uh, civil engineering to electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and today um, is the uh, last um, uh, uh, lecture of the series, um, which, um, as, as just mentioned, was funded by Nokia, and I think one of the goal of the series was also to raise awareness about how new cyber-physical systems were born, and I think we had a wonderful example of such a system which was announced uh, two weeks ago from this room. The Mobile Millennium uh, cyber-physical system was launched from Berkeley, and uh, we now have uh, thousands of people in Northern California who have downloaded this software um, and are running uh, the, the system on, all around the uh, Northern California. So if you're interested in uh, the Mobile Millennium, as well as the uh, uh, previous programs and watching the videos of the lecture series, you can go to our website, uh, traffic.berkeley.edu. So today, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jerry Marston from um, uh, Caltech. And so let me just give a, a quick uh, bio summary of, uh, for Jerry. So uh, Jerry got his uh, Bachelor in Applied Mathematics from the University of Toronto in 1965, a PhD in Applied Mathematics from Princeton in 1968, and was a professor of uh, mathematics here at uh, UC Berkeley uh, from 1970 to uh, 1995, and also in the X department from 1988 to 1995. Uh, he's currently the Carl F. Brown Professor of Engineering and Control in Dynamical Systems at Caltech, uh, and he's a recipient of numerous awards, uh, which include uh, the United Technologies Research Award uh, 2007. Uh, he's a, currently a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and the recipient from the 2005 uh, Siam von Neumann Lecture and Prize, as well as the Max Planck Research Prize uh, uh, from 2000 to 2005. So the title of his talk today will be uh, Discrete Mechanics and Optimal Control, and please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Marsden. So thank you very much, and thanks everybody for coming. So uh, this is a a relatively new development uh, in optimization techniques, um, optimization for mechanical systems, and uh, it was born a little bit out of the frustra frustration of using uh, current software packages that are out there. And uh, fortunately, in 2004, I had a sabbatical, and I was able to do some thinking. <laughs> And so this was actually born during my sabbatical in Germany in 2004. And so uh, the uh, people who uh, helped me do it were in the University of Paderborn at the time, Sina Oberblobaum and Oliver Junge. And Sina was a graduate student at the time, and well, she's now a postdoc with me. So you'll see her name here a number of times. So let me just say what we're trying to do. We're trying to do optimal control for mechanical systems, and the method we're using is this discrete mechanics and optimal control, or DMOC. Uh, we uh, are applying it to systems with constraints, like multi-body dynamics, think robotics. And uh, we also want to, I'll show you a little small example uh, of how it can be used for design of dynamics, and this is something that is very much uh, of interest in industry, um, and it's probably one of the reasons I'm pretty involved these days with United Technologies. And uh, then I want to talk about some global problems um, and how to overcome uh, uh, many of the difficulties with optimization algorithms. You can get easily stuck in local minima. Okay, so uh, the outline of my talk, I'll introduce DMOC, show you a few applications, talk a little bit about these constrained systems, 
and then a few uh, multi-body applications, a bit on optimal design, and then I'll come to these global issues. Okay, so uh, the, the DM and DMOC is discrete mechanics, and discrete mechanics has a, a long history. Uh, many people have participated in this. There are lots of uh, very complicated history. A lot of it actually was here at Berkeley. Belleville Cahan, for example, worked in a number of important things in this area. And at Berkeley here, a lot of uh, work, very important work that was inspirational for us on discrete optimal control was done here at Berkeley, especially in the 60s. So there's lots and lots of history. I don't have time to go into all the history. I'm just going to tell you more or less what it is. And let me start with a mechanical system that uh, there are no control forces, no, no external forces of any sort, and mechanics uh, is governed by variational principles. So we, write, we have a Lagrangian, and we set the variation of the integral of the Lagrangian to be zero, and this gives you the Euler-Lagrange equation. So this is F equals MA. There's lots of similar things on Hamiltonian mechanics and hybrid Lagrangian-Hamiltonian, but I'm, for purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on Lagrangian mechanics. Okay, so think of that as F equals MA, if you like. And there are deep links here with Hamilton-Jacobi theory, and uh, motivated by that, one defines a discrete Lagrangian by making a quadrature approximation of this action integral. And then the replacement for this principle is its discrete counterpart, and the replacement for the Euler-Lagrange ODEs are these discrete Euler-Lagrange equations. And uh, the idea here is to replace a curve by a chain of points. And uh, you think of the velocity somehow as uh, something that can be computed if you know two adjacent points, at least approximately. So think of this as a discrete way of encoding uh, both positions and velocities, but notice that, and this is important, that uh, really these are equations on sets of points in configuration space. Okay, so that's, uh, that's basically the main, uh, uh, the main uh, way we do discrete mechanics these days. It sounds very simple, but it took the community quite a long time to come to this simple conclusion. Now, uh, of course, uh, when you're dealing with control systems or systems with friction and so on, you need to add external forces to mechanical systems. And on the continuous level, that's done by modifying Hamilton's principle to the Lagrange de Lambert principle. So here are the forces, and this term here can be thought of as the virtual work done by those forces. And then the corresponding or the Lagrange equations just have these extra forces added on to that. And discretizing that's done by the same philosophy. You always focus not on discretizing the equations, but focus on discretizing the governing principle. And that leads to these discrete Lagrange de Lambert equations. Sorry, these ones. And here's the discrete Lagrange de Lambert principle. Now, when we're, uh, when we're going to do optimal control, we're going to have a cost function, too, and we want to optimize something subject to the equations of mechanics. So there's lots of reasons for, uh, at least for me, uh, for doing, uh, doing, mechanic, doing discrete mechanics and numerics this way. And uh, the reasons, firstly, are aesthetic. It's a very beautiful theory. It's self-contained. There's also practical reasons. Uh, let me tell you one of them right off that is a big benefit by doing it this way. For example, compared to other optimization packages, using DMOC right off the bat gives you a speed up factor of two just because you're working with configurations only and not configurations plus velocities. So if you take a generic optimization package, it will discretize both positions and velocities, then you have to uh, be optimizing over twice as many variables. And the, when the dust settles and you see how much computational effort it takes, 
Dmach gets a factor of two right out of the starting blocks. So uh, thinking really fundamentally about how these things work uh, definitely can pay off. Uh, the other thing is variational methods automatically build in the geometric structure of mechanics. So those of you that know about symplectic structures, which is a geometric notion in mechanics, and there are no forces, algorithms should be symplectic. And uh, uh, actually, as another interesting bit of Berkeley history, René de Vogelaire in 1956 was the first person to advocate doing integrations this way. And well, yeah, I mean, for instance, in many situations like integrating in the solar system, everybody would do it this way. So uh, anyway, we're consistent with that. If you have uh, symmetries and conservation laws, you have exactly discrete versions of that. But it doesn't stop there. There are lots of interesting and mysterious things that are happening. And some things have been proven, some things haven't. There's a lot of interesting open questions. For example, they get the statistics right. Uh, if you have a chaotic system and you're interested in the statistics, there also are, there are now developed uh, stochastic variational integrators and uh, they, get, they get all of the stochastics right when you update things. It could be, for example, noisy systems or systems where you've got fast and slow variables, lots of variations on the theme. And it's, it's truly amazing how well these algorithms work for such problems. And we understand some of it, but certainly not all of it. Okay, the, lastly, as far as optimal control is concerned, DMOC is easy to code and uh, this is one of the most attractive things. It's really simple. Okay, so I wanna just start with uh, a bit of uh, well-known stuff in uh, discrete mechanics that uh, has to do not with optimal control. So in optimal control, we're trying to find the optimal way of doing something. Like what's the optimal way for me to, say, navigate through a cluttered environment like these chairs or something to get from here over to there. Or uh, say a, uh, a helicopter flying in and around buildings. And you wanna find the optimal way to get from one place to another. Uh, but uh, discrete mechanics uh, really grew up in the uh, context of the initial value problem where we take initial data and let it evolve and see what happens. And I just want to show you here just a very simple example uh, of uh, how these variational methods avoid the plague of numerical dissipation. So for instance, here's an example of a conservative system it's just a particle moving in the plane under the influence of a certain radially symmetric but non-trivial potential. And uh, variational methods give you oscillations of the energy around the true value, which is this black line, whereas uh, non-variational Runge-Kutta methods, and there are variational Runge-Kutta methods, but non-variational ones have this standard and kind of plaguey behavior of numerical dissipation. And when you add dissipation, so energy should go down, uh, these variational methods track the uh, benchmark solution here amazingly well. Whereas, again, in dissipative systems, there's, uh, if you get the dissipation rate wrong, then this is, this is bad. So they, uh, variational methods uh, cure problems like that for ODEs. They've been extended to PDEs. This is a uh, elastic L-beam done with uh, asynchronous variational methods. Asynchronous meaning you can take different time steps and at different places, so big, uh, big elements here, you can take uh, bigger time steps than the small elements, so exploiting asynchronicity is uh, just to show you that variational methods are very flexible uh, they can, uh, they can uh, be used in such situations. And in, if you take a model with no dissipation, even after millions of updates, it, the energy behavior is beautiful. This is a, a uh, I forgot to put the credits down here. This is a computation done by Adrian Liu from Stanford. 
and uh, they can deal with collision problems really well. This is a really hard collision problem where two elastic, uh, two elastic plates, a ball and a flat plate collide. Uh, that's not easy. And uh, for those of you that uh, know what, there's a, Hamil there's a Lagrangian Hamiltonian hybrid that's relating to, related to one of Alan Weinstein's favorite topics, Dirac structures, the Hamilton Pontryagin uh, variational principle that's a hybrid or a combination of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. And we tried that out on this uh, Stanford bunny here. It works really well. I want to make a little uh, uh, remark on fluid mechanics. This I, I, I have nothing t concrete to report in terms, at least in terms of pretty pictures, but we've uh, we're developing a discrete uh, discrete version not only of solids but also of fluids. And this is mainly with Matthew de Brun. He's in computer science at Caltech. And uh, the theory is almost complete now, and some simple implementations are done. But the full-blown impact of this is we still have a lot, of, a lot of work to do. For example, in this theory, we have an exact discrete Kelvin circulation theorem. That's something that people have been looking for in fluid codes for quite some time. We think we've, no, we know we've got it. And uh, if those of you that know me from the math side, I, I did a lot of early work on the variational structure of fluid mechanics. And for that, you need to go to the Lagrangian framework. And at least if you have fixed boundaries, then it's related to how you think of fluid motion as the motion of particles. And the motion of particles is governed by mappings. In fact, they're invertible mappings, so they're diffeomorphisms. And one of the secrets to doing this was how to, uh, how to discretize the diffeomorphism group and still have a group. And uh, we know now that the way to do that is to put your probability hat on and look at the group of doubly stochastic matrices, the beautiful group. And in the limit, as the mesh goes to zero, it converges to this group. And in the end, what you get are uh, weak solutions to the fluid equations that are related to Brenier's, Brenier's work. I want to also mention, I see Fran Francesco is here. If you take a special case of the way of, of the algorithm that uh, we developed, it actually reduces to an algorithm of uh, Armero and Simo in a paper they wrote in uh, 93, I think it was, or maybe it appeared in 94. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, very nice, uh, a very nice algorithm. And I, I don't know if you realized you were actually doing variational integrators at the time, but you didn't do it that way. But it is, that's what the algorithm is. It comes right out of this methodology. And so now we know how to do it for irregular meshes, and we're hopeful we can do free boundary problems and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, uh, that's for the future. I just wanted to, just wanted to mention that. Okay, so discrete mechanics, uh, as you hopefully I've conveyed, it's a, now a very mature and interesting subject, and it's also lots of practical implementations of it. So let's now try to combine discrete mechanics with optimal control. And the way we do that is, in a sense, obvious. We, uh, since we have the DMA, DM part of it already, you overlay this with a, I'd say, a standard way to discretize a cost function. And we discretize this in a way that's consistent with the way we discretize um, the mechanics part. So we deal with pairs of points representing the configuration, uh, a pair of configurations. And, uh, and we, the objective is to minimize such a cost function subject to the uh, appropriate force discrete Euler-Lagrange equations. And by the way, uh, if you're interested in different orders of accuracy and so on, uh, just like you do with multiple shooting and collocation and so on, you can make the discrete equations as accurate as you want. And in, in many problems, there's sort of no point in 
making them too accurate because you're more interested in problems with noise, the modeling may not be quite right. Uh, so accuracy for us is not necessarily a huge issue, but if you have problems where that's important, one can deal with that, no problem. Anyway, so we, uh, one of the attractive features of all of this is that this, seems, this methodology seems very stable to adding noise and having, um, having say model uncertainty and so on, which uh, you know is really important in practice. Okay, anyway, so uh, you take the problem of minimizing this, we already have the discrete equations that we uh, treat as constraints, and we ask a, a methodology like sequential quadratic programming or uh, root finders, there's lots of things you could do here. We just ask an existing piece of software for instance, SQP is in MATLAB, although for industrial strength problems, you do not want to use MATLAB. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, there are standard methods for numerically implementing things like this, and that's how we implement it. Very simple. So just to recap, DMOB, we start by variationally discretizing the cost function and the equations of motion, and we have a, 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 a string of configuration points and you have a discrete function on there, the cost function with constraints, the discrete equations. You send that to an optimizer along with an initial guess and, uh, and say go. And uh, I'll come at the end of the talk with this whole problem with initial guesses and local minima. It's a serious problem in, in optimization and we think we have a way around it. Okay, so here's a, here's a simple toy example, just so you know what I'm talking about. Suppose your Lagrangian is kinetic minus potential, standard Lagrangian, and you have some control forces. Then, the, then an example of a discrete uh, Lagrangian would be sort of a stupid, well, I shouldn't say stupid, a very simple quadrature rule. You just evaluate the Lagrangian somewhere and multiply by the length of the interval, and you uh, pick appropriate um, forces. Then the discrete or the Lagrange equations give you, well, give you an update rule. And this, of course, reminds you very much of, of forces. These forces and the potential forces should equal mass times acceleration. Anyway, uh, as, when you do this, you can be guaranteed that if there are no forces, and no friction that this will be, a, in an appropriate sense, a symplectic algorithm, always, no matter how you choose the discrete Lagrangian. Okay, we've done all of the numerical analysis that's needed for convergence and, you know, that people in this business do. And I just want to point out there's a picture here to back up what I said about fewer variables. And remember, DMOC is not an all-purpose algorithm. And this is one of the things that is both good and bad. I mean, if you have an all-purpose algorithm to optimize anything, anywhere, any kind of equation, that's fine. But when you apply it to mechanics, and you have positions and velocities as your state variables, you're not exploiting that structure. So we get a factor of two saving, computational savings just by exploiting that structure. And we can do many other things too. But this kind of work diagram here compared with the number of discretization points just shows you numerically that's really the case. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this approach is, as I said, very flexible. It can be applied to uh, not single systems. We, we, are, we apply it to all sorts of multi-vehicle systems and so on. So uh, that's the other attractive feature about these Variational methods, as I've already mentioned, they're very flexible and they can be applied in a wide variety of situations. So uh, let me just give you a couple of first simple examples. Uh, and in fact, I want to emphasize this guy, James Martin, was an undergraduate and he did the falling cat coding. So uh, he did it from scratch as an undergraduate project. So it's not that complicated. So there's the traditional falling cat. Those of you that know me know I've had an interest in falling cats for decades. And so here's a little simulation of how the cat actually turns over. It's 
based on a multi-body model called the kane schur model. Uh, this is the Kane, famous for this sort of thing at Stanford. And uh, Ava Kanso, who was a postdoc of mine, she, she was a graduate student here with Panos Papadopoulos. And uh, she's now at uh, USC. She looked at optimal swimming, how to, uh, uh, what internal shape changes should a fish-like object use in order to most efficiently swim. And uh, this is, of course, a lot harder than that. But I just wanted to put them down as a simple example. Uh, here's another example. Uh, uh, OK, it has fancy graphics, but the math is pretty simple. So uh, we've, uh, one of my current postdocs, Marin, he's uh, an expert on things like helicopter models. And so we used his model with DMOC to find an optimal way for this helicopter here to uh, navigate this terrain and, and land on that little helipad there. So these are the sorts of problems that DMOC can do, and it does very well. Now, for constrained systems, uh, uh, you know, usually you impose constraints. So what is an example of a constraint I'm thinking of? Well, think of a multi-body system, like your arm. Yeah, so here's a rigid body. Think of two rigid bodies, this one and this one. They're connected to each other with a joint. And the joint in your elbow is different than the joint in your shoulder. So these are constraints, right? Because it can only move in certain ways. I can't bend it in, in any old angle. So how do you handle such constraints? Well, in mechanics, there's a well-known way of doing this with Lagrange multipliers. And here's a discrete version of that. So here's a Lagrange multiplier en enforcing a constraint, say a certain function of the uh, configuration variable should be 0. Yeah. So you end up with discrete forced Euler-Lagrange equations. Uh, there's a problem with that, though, a serious problem, if you're not careful. And this already occurs in the falling cat. Um, the problem is that uh, if you use Lagrange multipliers, you can easily end up with ill conditioning, serious ill conditioning. And this really mucks up the works when you're trying to uh, either do the initial value problem or DMOC. And fortunately, uh, <clears throat> fortunately uh, uh, another postdoc that I shared with uh, Michael Ortiz came to the rescue. She, this is Sigrid Leyendecker. She uh, uh, developed a method uh, called the discrete null space method, which really dealt with this ill conditioning problem. And so uh, as, a, at a, as a postdoc at Caltech, she combined her discrete null space method, which was sort of grew up in the initial value world. She uh, adapted it to DMOC, and it worked really well. And it fit like a glove. She had, uh, uh, she had tried her discrete null space method with various techniques uh, for integrating multi-body mechanics. And Variational methods uh, r bubbled up to the surface as being uh, uh, computationally the best. So here's an example. So imagine you have a satellite like the Space uh, Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. It reorients itself in space by manipulating momentum wheels, as you saw there. And so the problem is how do you uh, change the orientation of the satellite from, say, pointing at a star there to pointing to a star there. It's, a, it's, uh, it's in the same category as the falling cat. You want the thing to reorient itself, but the angular momentum of the system is zero through the whole procedure. So, uh, of course, you, you, you expend energy by spinning the wheels. So energy isn't supposed to be conserved, and you see it's not. Yet the angular momentum is identically conserved. 
Now here's, a, here's an example where the built-in angular momentum respect in discrete mechanics is important. Because for this kind of a system, you do not want to have residual angular momentum, even numerical, mucking up the works, right? Because you want this thing to point exactly at the star and with no angular momentum at all. And you can see that as Dimoc finds, uh, finds the solution, the angular momentum is dead zero through the whole uh, maneuver. Yeah, and so uh, we did it with the underactuated case too, with just two rotors. So the fact that uh, the rotation group is non-abelian and can be sort of generated by two of the dimensions is the reason you can also do this with uh, just two rotors. It's not as efficient, but you can still do it. And uh, this is just a little zoo of all the different uh, kinds of constraints that one can, one can deal with. And I have a ton of movies of all sorts of fancy mechanical gadgets with this and that constraint to which DMOC can be applied. One of the, more in, one of the ones that I'm uh, particularly interested in is, uh, is uh, robotic walkers. So uh, robotic walkers are interesting because it's a hybrid system and uh, um, so for instance the, config the very configuration manifold may change. So for instance if I'm walking I have one configuration manifold when this foot is on the ground and I switch to another one when this is on the ground. So you have to have a method of switching and as we saw before uh, the very fact that um, uh, variational methods can handle collisions very well is uh, also manifested here that it can handle these. So uh, besides Sigrid, I have a graduate student in mechanical engineering who's uh, done a lot of the work on this and he actually uh, collaborated with Aaron Ames who was a graduate student here. An expert on uh, robotic walkers. So here's a 3D walker just walking along, just showing that you that we really can apply DMOC to these things. That is the most uh, efficient way for it to walk from point A to point B. Okay, now I, I, I want to bring in here another, another idea which is important in design. So I'm getting to the design part. Um, so there's a technique for optimization called uh, MTO or multi-scale trend optimization that goes back to work of John Dennis at Rice. It's an, it's an old method. And uh, recently uh, we've been collaborating with Rafi Koifman at Yale and Yanis Kevrakidis at Princeton uh, on this method and, and applying it. We applied it to a certain self-assembly problem which I can discuss with you privately if you're interested. But the point is that this is a method that works well for, it's got nothing to do with discrete mechanics, but you'll see how it comes in in a second. But it's really appropriate for co cost functions that are noisy, very multi-scale, and expensive to evaluate. And this is a method for finding global minima. Uh, and, uh, you know, given certain, uh, I mean, of course, given certain assumptions and conditions, there's a big theory behind this. So, for instance, we applied it to this certain self-assembly problem and uh, there was an existing paper in the literature that used simulated annealing to find the optimal, uh, optimal way for, these, for particles to assemble themselves. And using this method, we got 100 times speed up. And every time, as soon as that happened, I became a real fan of this MTO method. So this is the kind of problem you're faced with. Imagine you have a cost function like this. It's very multi-scale. It's got lots of, tons of little maxima, tons of little minima, very non-convex. And, uh, you know, if you apply standard optimization tools to things like this, they just won't work. You get hung up on a local minimum somewhere or there can be lots of difficulties. This is the actual cost function that we were trying to minimize for this particular self-assembly problem. So what uh, the idea of multi-scale trend optimization is to look for general trends in the cost function uh, 
at, at, a, at an appropriate length scale. And you adjust the scales and um, it'll do a lot of that adjusting for you. I mean, for instance, your eye can easily pick out where you should look for the minima here. It looks like there's a deep minima there. There may be some minima here, but they are occurring at different scales. These are really interesting, uh, inter interesting problems. So we're going to use that now. Imagine, now, the de design of dynamics problem is this. So suppose I want to optimize the design of a system, maybe a robotic walker like this. <clears throat> So what we do is set up an inner loop and an outer loop where uh, on the inner loop we have DMOC. So you give me a design of a particular walker, say how long should the feet be or how plastic should the feet be. And then uh, I'll find using DMOC the optimal way or the, op the value of the cost function, the best value of the cost function for this walker to walk from point A to point B. Okay, and then uh, multi-scale trend optimization will then do an optimization over the parameters. So you want to maybe change the length of the feet a little bit and see if it uh, gets any better or gets any worse. So we do multi-scale trend optimization on this outer loop and DMOC on the inner loop. So when, you, when dynamics is involved, this is the sort of uh, message we're envisioning. So here's an example that we tried it out on, just to try it out. So here you have this little stick walker, and you'd like to know where, what's the best place to put the knees. Yeah, I mean, nature has done this. I mean, presumably your knees are at an optimal place. But this is a very different from a standard optimal control problem or other optimization problems, because you're, you're trying to optimize dynamics. So I want to, A, walk efficiently, but I want a design of my system so that uh, it's, good from the, it's good from the design point of view. So you can see why in industry they're very interested in this sort of thing. So here's another example, different position of the knees. Yeah, and of course on simple systems like this, you want it to agree with your intuition. But if you have a complex, high dimensional system, you want to do this uh, systematically. So in this particular case, the uh, trend optimization picked out, picked out that particular position of the knees. And this is something we're now engaged in applying to much more complicated, more realistic systems. So design of dynamics uh, uh, is you know, definitely on our plates. So DMOC is playing an important role in design of dynamics, bottom line. Okay, now what about this issue of local versus global? So here comes DMOC primitives and roadmap, uh, roadmap methodology. So what's a DMOC primitive? Or what's a primitive in general? What you do is you get all sorts of uh, basic maneuvers, like here's a left turn maneuver, think little helicopter, and here's a turning maneuver, uh, and uh, Imagine, imagine that you make a library of basic maneuvers. So the way we make basic maneuvers, we just say, okay, helicopter, go from here to there. What's the optimal way to do it? So we find a little maneuver that will do this optimally. We compute it, store it in a library. And we get a library of basic maneuvers. So these are called DMOC primitives. And the whole idea is it's a lot easier to look up things in a library than it is to compute them from scratch. And the way we globalize this is to put it together with uh, graph techniques and roadmap. So for instance, imagine you have a uh, vehicle that you would like to maneuver through all these obstacles in an optimal way to go from the beginning to the end. Now if I give you an initial guess, say this one, and plug that into DMOC, it will optimize that. But it will never even explore other possibilities. Maybe there's a better path going in a sort of topologically distinct way. Well, roadmap techniques throw down a graph of possibilities and use dynamic programming just to search over them all really fast. So you can do a complicated 
a complicated uh, problem like this in just a few seconds on, on your laptop. So that's the, that's the key benefit is that it's fast. So uh, the point is that DMOC is playing a fundamental role currently in these sorts of global, global techniques. <clears throat> so uh, just to be a little more concrete, imagine you want to you're interested in, uh, say, helicopters flying around in buildings, and you want to know the optimal way to get from one point to another. Think about cluttered terrain, as I've been mentioning. So here's, an, just to show you sort of visually how this works, you see all of these little uh, possible paths are laid down there. So that's the computer throwing down this graph of possible roadmaps. Think you want to navigate from address A in Berkeley to address B in San Francisco, right? There's a lot of possible routes you could take. What's the best route? So roadmap strategies from computer science have long since dealt with this and dynamic programming going back to Bellman and so on. Uh, these are very beautiful methods for solving that. And uh, the nice thing is that this is a way around this global local issue. If you, if you adopt this point of view where you put things in libraries and compute local, local optima, then the global part is taken care of for you by roadmap and dynamic programming. And the nice thing is that the, the dynamics can be pretty complicated. If you, you offline build a big enough library, they might be DMOC or they might actually be real vehicle dynamics flown by expert pilots and then recorded. That would also be a primitive. So we're actually working with uh, Georgia Tech who have a fleet of real helicopters and fixed wing aircraft to, to implement these methods on real vehicles. Again, this is just showing you sort of the idea of throwing down possible, uh, possible paths, then you do a search over that graph. <coughs> So uh, one of the interesting projects we've been working on uh, recently, this is uh, sort of not even in the literature yet, is a method we call DIGS, which means dynamic greedy search. It's our code name for search algorithms. So I'll just show you an example of this. And this also uses DMOC primitives as a basic thing, but it's a global problem. So imagine that you are searching for a target. Maybe it's somebody uh, lost in the jungles or something like this. And you have some idea where they might be. So you start by setting up a probability distribution of where you think they are. And then you start searching. You set up your vehicle motion primitives that you can very quickly draw from the library. So you don't have to do complicated uh, dynamic computations on the fly. You're sort of doing lookup because you've pre-computed the dynamics. And uh, so, uh, so this is just an example of something we did that shows you searching that prior probability distribution with a vehicle. In fact, we've done this with, um, you know, in a pretty sophisticated context where 50 vehicles are searching all, all at once. No collisions, are no collisions are guaranteed. And it's nearly optimal. You really cannot do much better than this. And the motion is essentially chaotic. That translates into it's very robust. We've tested these against systematic lawnmower type searches and this beats the pants off them. And uh, another future direction is to include uh, uncertainty. Uh, maybe you've got uh, motion around these buildings and some initial, uh, some initial uncertainty about where a target might be and maybe these Pro this probability distribution is going to kind of spread around this building here so you don't know which side it's on. So how should you distribute your assets to uh, get the maximum probability of finding this object? Again, DMOC primitives play a crucial role in understanding things like this. All right. One more application of DMOC. Uh, Invariant manifolds. Why the heck am I talking about invariant manifolds from dynamical systems? Well, uh, you know, the world is big out there. There are lots of various 
uh, interesting ideas. And uh, invariant manifolds turn out to be uh, another interest of mine. And uh, space mission design is another interest of mine. And uh, this is a lovely example because in some problems there can be extra structure that uh, just like exploiting mechanics as a structure, a problem may have yet more structure that you want to exploit. Symmetries can be one. This is another one. So uh, this is related to, a, a top, uh, to another talk which is about Lagrangian coherent structures, which corresponds to invariant manifolds. And the idea here is that I want to combine DMOC with invariant manifolds. And I'll give you a concrete example in a second. But first of all, you should be aware that invariant manifolds have already been used. In particular, the NASA, NASA mission called the Genesis Discovery Mission it flew between these dates, it went out and collected solar wind samples and brought them back to Earth. And it flew on a nearly heteroclinic return orbit in the three-body problem. And it flew along invariant manifolds. This is its trajectory. Uh, so, uh, right, this really works. So it flew a million and a half kilometers towards the sun and also away from the sun using no, essentially no fuel. This is one of the most fuel-efficient missions ever flown. And the way it's able to do it is it exploits the three-body effects, uh, the Earth pulling on, on the satellite and the Sun pulling on the satellite. And so you don't think Keplerian motions, you think more subtle motions. And the three-body problem has periodic orbits in it. This flew out, uh, jumped onto the invariant, to the stable manifold of this periodic orbit, flew for free, million and a half kilometers towards the sun, used a little bit of fuel to stay on that unstable periodic orbit, and to come back to Earth, it nudged off it and did this lovely heteroclinic return orbit back to, the, back to the Earth. There's another family of periodic orbits not shown out here that it uh, uh, used in, in this. So uh, this is just a, a, a picture of uh, what uh, I'm saying here, so this is, to, this is a periodic orbit out there in the three-body problem, and uh, the, the surface you see there is the invariant manifold attached to that periodic orbit. In this, in this particular case, it's the unstable manifold because it's a little bit like an inverted pendulum. It's unstable, and I'd like to push it in the right direction so then it falls where we want it to fall. So understanding this natural dynamics is absolutely crucial to modern space mission design. It's one of the big victories. I like to I do a jig or something. This is one of the big victories for dynamical systems. It's surprising how few people know about that. Anyway, big, big deal. Uh, and of course, uh, nature was there first. Uh, nature already knows all about uh, invariant manifolds and celestial mechanics. This is a picture uh, of uh, a, a rendering of actual data of a comet that uh, interacted with Jupiter. So this is Jupiter here, this little dot, there's the sun. And you can see it, it spent some time outside the orbit of Jupiter and then it came inside the orbit of Jupiter. It actually did what's called a resonance hopping, which is another very interesting feature. If you go to rotating coordinates so that it becomes an autonomous system, here's Jupiter here, and you draw invariant manifolds of these periodic orbits that I described before, you see it's amazing how well this follows these invariant manifolds. And well, invariant manifolds are manifolds along which you fall, you, you move without any effort just naturally. How do we combine DMOC with invariant manifolds? Well, the problem that uh, this got applied to is to design a low, traject a low thrust trajectory from the uh, Earth to the Moon. So delta V means is a measure of how much fuel you need to change the velocity by an amount delta V. So uh, uh, the way this is uh, is done, and spacecraft actually 
used methods like this to get to the moon. For instance, the ESA mission SMART-1 used a technique like this. Uh, there's a lot of history there, which I don't have time to go into. It's a whole story by itself. But basically, you think of going to the moon as a concatenation of two different three-body problems. The two different three-body problems are Earth, spacecraft, sun, Earth, spacecraft, moon. And you look at invariant manifolds for those two problems and you, you uh, glue them together to get, a, uh, to get a good trajectory. And it basically flies for free on this point here. You apply a delta V right there. I should say, why is there a delta V? It looks like these are coincident. They're coincident in configuration space, but the velocities are different. So you have to apply a delta V to jump from one to the other. So you do a delta V, you jump, and then you float. So that's basically the design methodology. And uh, right, so there's a trajectory uh, correction there, uh, 158 meters per second. And there's also some uh, initial and final delta Vs to get you out of Earth orbit and into, into the moon's orbit. So we. Take such, a, uh, take such a trajectory designed by invariant manifolds and a very simple uh, control maneuver. We use that as an initial guess for DMOC. And uh, DMOC optimizes it, but now in the four-body problem, because it's really a four-body problem, right? Sun, spacecraft, Earth, moon. <laughs> so in the four-body problem, you optimize it. And DMOC doesn't care you know, we know a lot about the three-body problem. We know a lot about invariant manifolds for the three-body problem. But God help me, four-body problem, this is too much. But DMOC doesn't care. It takes the, your initial design that was designed by thinking of two concatenated three-body problems. And it, it, uh, uh, it's fine. It, it uh, just optimizes it. And look at the improvement. It's fantastic. Okay, so uh, another thing that uh, is going on in my group is taking things like fleets of vehicles where we say, uh, I have a group of, uh, say, six hovercraft, and I say, you go form a hexagon over there with a certain radius and a certain center, and you figure out yourselves who should go where. These are tough problems, and there's this is a problem even just with a few vehicles that can have a huge number of local minima because all the different permutations that are possible. So here this is even simpler uh, case, just three vehicles forming a triangle. But these roadmap methods look extremely promising for sorting out the local versus global. So already in a problem like this, uh, in fact, Cena in her thesis looked at six hovercraft and basically just by hand, took a huge number of initial guesses and found roughly 25 different local minima. And you look down the list with your eye and you say, that looks like the global one. But a DMOC with uh, these primitives and roadmap strategies, it picks, it, it picks that one out just like that. So it, it looks like this is going to be a great tool for uh, uh, doing these global, globally optimal strategies. Of course, another big uh, area that's really important are multi-objective problems. There's a version of multi-objective DMOC being developed where you have trade-offs between, for instance, the amount of fuel you use and the time it gets there. Uh, people in optimization know about these trade-off curves. You know, one gets better, the other gets worse, and DMOC looks like it's, at least for mechanics, problems can be uh, adapted to that in a, in a very good way. OK, so I, it's 1 o'clock. I'm, uh, I'm done here. Let me just summarize. So I've told you about DMOC. It's efficient. It's as efficient and numerically as good as other algorithms out there. So the numerical analysis is the same. And we get this factor of 2. We respect symmetry. So, but from a numerical analysis point of view, you know, as the same kind of numerical analysis as existing ones, and we've done all of that analysis. Uh, and the, the main difference is it's structured. It, re it respects the structure of mechanics. We've applied it to a lot of examples, satellites, 
our walkers and so on. We've combined it with lots of different things, such as trend optimization for design of dynamics. And we've introduced it in the context of global optimization techniques, roadmap and dynamic programming strategies, and lots of future directions such as multi-objective applications and so on. Okay, that's it. Uh, you can find, I try to keep my website reasonably up to date. It's impossible, of course, but I try. You can uh, go and look there or uh, feel free to send me an email. I'll do my best to keep up with the multitudinous emails. Thank you. So in the tradition of the cyber lectures, we're going to give you the plaque commemorative oh. lecture. And I think we have a couple minutes for oh, questions in the audience uh, if people want to ask questions. So uh, I guess the way you are solving the global optimization problem uh, using primitives, I, my conjecture is that it works well because it's an easy problem to solve. Uh, simply because combining primitives, so you are, you are saying, are you, um, my, my understanding is that this primitive works in only in the state space. Do you, your states are uh, positions, velocity and accelerations are only positions. No, uh, they, remember, they, accelerations are taken care of because these primitives have been optimized somehow. So forces have been optimized. They're control systems. But primitives are in position velocity space. And when you join primitives together, you must join them so the velocities at the boundaries match. So that when you join them, you get a true trajectory for the joined system. Yeah? So you have to match position and velocity at the boundaries. Okay, so they might. And, and this, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this, uh, this, does, this applies to hard problems as well as easy ones. No, but what I would say is that if you assume that you say that there is only one way to go through uh, two obstacles, and then there is, a, are, you, are you assuming there's a lower level control? For instance, you showed the helicopter. Yeah. Are you assuming that there's a lower level control that is able to keep this velocity given a certain uh, configuration of the helicopter in the space? Well, this is all, yeah, this is what, this lower level local control is done with DMOC, and there can be, there are all sorts of, for instance, we put in velocity constraints, acceleration constraints, or force constraints, okay. and collision constraints so it doesn't hit the walls. But modulo those, uh, then the global search is looking for the sort of, to deal with the combinatorial problem of all the different okay. ways you can deal with the topology of the buildings. But locally, it's, it's the way the vehicle really would fly, and it uh, respects all the constraints and limitations of that particular system. So those uh, local primitives are always feasible. That is the, probably the, the, the question is, what are you assuming these primitives are always feasible, but there is the configuration when you uh, solve your dynamic programming backwards. The, uh, the uh, yes, we only deal with feasible uh, trajectories, but keep in mind, the helicopter, in particular, we've applied this to a helicopter navigating in 3D through a complicated maze of buildings. I'd say that's a fairly hard problem. And uh, the helicopter dynamics itself is under-actuated. So, right, like a real helicopter. So uh, the under-actuation is, uh, is important, but of course, we, when we look at primitives, the, since the primitives are computed, we only search o we're only searching over feasible trajectories, because these are pre-computed trajectories we know we can achieve. Okay. Any other question? Well, how much effort, how much effort have you expended in building up these libraries, and? How often do you find that a previously assembled library is uh, now realized incomplete and you've got to augment it? Yeah, that's certainly an important question and it's related to another, uh, another issue here. And that is, for example, if you're doing a search algorithm, in the, in the middle of the search, you might gain information and for instance, the terrain you're searching over might not be what you thought it was five minutes ago. 
And this is one of the advantages of primitives, but with primitives you have to make sure ahead of time that you've captured all the dynamical motions you want to use. And if you haven't, at the moment, there's no way to fix that on the fly because DMOC primitives have to be computed offline and assembled. So if you've missed some important things, then this experiment will be lousy and you'll realize you've missed something and you'll say, I'll go do another, the next generation of the experiment. But one thing you do want to do on the fly is update things like terrain information or updated, uh, you know, you get some new information, oh, the thing I'm searching for is now more likely to be over there. And you could want to be able to research that area in, a, in, a, in an efficient way on the fly. That's certainly, that's okay, you can do that. Yeah, so some things you can do on the fly sort of adaptively in real time, and other things like assembling the library, you can't. Not yet, anyway. But my question was a quantitative question. How much effort goes into the library compared with the amount of effort expended when you've got the library to solve yeah. a specific problem? Because that library represents an investment, yes. and I'm curious about the return on that investment. Yes, and, and that's, that is a, uh, directly a function of how complicated the dynamics is. So if you have very simple particle dynamics, uh, you know, just a particle that can have a force applied in any direction, then, yeah, it's child's play to build up the library. You can do that very quickly. So there, there the comparative savings is uh, maybe a factor of 10. But if you have complicated dynamics, like a helicopter of the sort I showed there, then the difference in eff effort expended is in the thousands. Yeah, so it's a huge, a huge difference in effort. Yeah, where it really takes some effort to compute all the primitives and assemble a big enough library to make it work. Lots of aircraft, by the way, fly using essentially the same idea as primitives, right? Because you develop experience with motions. If I do this or that with the rudders, the, the airplane will react this or that way. You can't sort of do real-time CFD on the fly, of course. So they, you know, this sort of, uh, this is, one of the ways people thought of with doing wind tunnel experiments, you, you're assembling ex experience and you're assembling lookup tables so that when you pull, uh, move the rudders a certain way, you know what's going to happen. I, I would say that's the same sense in which we're using primitives. Right, well, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Professor Marsden again for his beautiful talk. <laughs>